Oh. Good morning. Parked in a bus stop today. Go on. I'm a bit later than normal. It was um, Easter Monday. It's Tuesday, the 1st of May. Well, it might be. It might not. I don't know. I've got one of those watches. You know that winds itself up? It's not angry. It's a bit of a tight wad. I don't know if you've realised that yet. But I thought, oh, that'll be a good idea. I'm fed up with replacing watch batteries. Because I won't pay £25 to a jeweller to replace a watch battery that costs three quid. I'd rather order the um, the battery, you know, and then order the jeweller's tools, being a dentist and everything, and having the hands of a surgeon, a microsurgeon, and take the watch apart by learning, by spending hours on YouTube, and then put it back together, knowing that it's not waterproof because I don't have a replacement seal set or any, or any oil or jeweler's glue to glue it all back together again so <laughs> they've got a few always have a few washers left over on the desk uh, and at least the uh, the watch uh, you know starts working again but I got fed up with that because I think I ordered some batteries and they didn't come and it wasn't worth it for the two quid or three quid or something so I thought oh I know I'll get a watch that burns itself and it's got this weight in it that as you throw your hand around it sort of so in fact it's so uncomfortable it makes you do that to, and that helps it wind itself up I think they've realized that if they make it a bit uncomfortable then then you'll just waggle it around a bit more and it'll wind itself up it's winding me up anyway so uh, yeah and also it's like a <clears throat> it's like a Fitbit in that uh, if it stops working completely you know that you've been in bed too long because when it doesn't wind itself up while you're in bed and so like if you wake yourself up if you wake up in the morning and it says like it's two o'clock in the afternoon or three o'clock in the middle of the night and it's actually eight o'clock in the morning then <clears throat> you know it sort of must have run down because it hasn't really been <clears throat> moved around enough just to even wind it up for one day and that means that you're a bit too lazy you've been a bit too lazy so it's more it's like an unfit bit <coughs> excuse me Anyway, I was going to talk about the association and uh, I thought I might do that today. I'll try and get it all crammed in before uh, I get to work because these videos are typically about 19 minutes long, aren't they? So, 20 minutes long. So, Anyway, what, what do I want to tell you about the association? Well, look, first of all, you're getting these videos as a member um, because they only go out to members of the association and they're unlisted on eBay, so you can't search for them. You have to have the link and we send out, or I send out the link every day, so I mean, I'm mean, i not saying that you couldn't share a link and in fact if you think one is particularly useful and it might get someone to join the association then by all means uh, send them the link but I think once you send someone the link then I think they can subscribe to the Angry Dentist videos and so they end up getting the whole thing for nothing which is a bit of a, <clears throat> a problem because associations always have this problem that you know how do you, <clears throat> how do you charge for what you do? And it was an, that was a problem for the association in the early days because uh, the the sort of predecessors of the current dental fusion organisation, which were the General Dental Practitioners Association, for many years started in 1953-54 by a guy called Malik, uh, and then uh, latterly the uh, Dental Practitioners Association, which then became Dental Fusion or morphed into Dental Fusion. Um, and what they they were sort of primarily can you know upset about terms and conditions and concentrated far more on or almost exclusively on terms and conditions as opposed to the sort of the social and clinical aspects which the BDA was so keen of in all the branches and the sections and the um, endless uh, postgraduate meetings about uh, endodontics and stuff like that so um, and the problem is that um, you know if you get, if you get a victory, like for example our our um, investigation into the PRSBPL, um, you know that is generally beneficial to the profession and 
dentists realise that they don't have to join an association to get those benefits. I mean, you can that that sort of pioneering work is benefits everybody, whether they're in the association or not. So, as an association, how do you fund yourself? Um, you know, why? What what's the incentive there for people to pay you money if they're going to get the benefits, whether they pay you the money or not? And that's always been a you know a, a interesting question. The GDPA was always sort of really divided into two parts. That was the part that you paid for and the part that you got, everyone got for free, which was the, the general lobbying on terms and conditions. Um, when we went along to the review body, any, any good that we did was, you know, was sucked up by the profession as a whole, including the many dentists who didn't contribute towards us preparing and, and going to those meetings. So what you did was you've got a sort of a, a Jekyll and Hyde association. It's quite a dichotomous where uh, some of the work was done pro bono and it was paid for by the the other side of it, which people were prepared to pay for. Now, what are people prepared to pay for? They're, pre they're prepared to pay for anything that where they see uh, value, you know, where they see more coming in in terms of going out. So, you know, if you're selling £10 notes for a fiver, then you're going to do a brisk trade. So the thing is that all the value added services became an end in themselves. So, you know, the, the British Dental Association provided everything and then there were two associations which at one time were thought to be sort of quite serious competitors to each other and then and then the whole market just fragmented and you've got uh, <clears throat> you've got um, people offering to do uh, compliance inspection and testing and then uh, other people offering to you know cover other <clears throat> aspects of the practice uh, you've got capitation providers you've got uh, discussion forums um, you know charitable associations the whole thing the whole thing just broke up and what that did was that left the representative associations with the unprofitable side of the business that is the bit that benefits everybody whether they join or not and is quite expensive to pursue and um, uh, but difficult to sort of uh, to put a fence around so anyway the uh, GDPA uh, and, and also I mean I'll, I'll, I'll continue with the sort of the, the theme the history of it but I mean it's these days most people are less sort of I would say the word is sort of politicised. They're less um, willing to join an association. You know, 50 years ago, if you believed in something, you supported it by supporting it. <laughs> you literally, you joined an association, you paid a subscription, you went along to meetings, you volunteered for stuff. Nowadays, people don't do that. That's very old-fashioned. You know, and I'm not talking necessarily about trade unionism. I'm just talking about how people believe that they are supporting something they uh, you know the Facebook like has replaced the the activism um, and I think in a way that's not that's quite understandable because activism itself has become less effective you know you're uh, the, the sort of the establishment is quite um, adept now at sort of dealing and with people who march and carry placards and uh, or write uh, petitions and things like that they know they know these things are, are not are going to come to nothing and they ensure that they come to nothing um, it's a way of letting people vent um, you know their anger and then doing what you wanted to do anyway you know and it's you know you see this in so many areas you see it in uh, things like uh, the price of petrol for example that you know the price of petrol shoots up it hits a certain um, what the government calls a totemic Price or a to there's a totemic event like a totem pole, something that everybody agrees is they can they can gather around and protest and they all agree on this one thing that this one thing is either acceptable or, or unacceptable, and then what happens is that the refineries get shut down, the lorry drivers go on strike, there's general chaos and the government backs off from these totemic events. Um, they um, they are appear to give in that's what the their playbook is they appear to give in and then what happens is that they then um, when things have quietened down again 
they just slowly, slowly, slowly this time, because they realised they just did everything too fast, they slowly, slowly um, put the prices back up. And so we find that, you know, like uh, two years later, the petrol prices are higher than they were when all the refineries were shut down and the, and the lorry drivers were on strike. And you say, well, how are they, why were they on strike, you know, at like £1.50 a litre, and they're not on strike at £1.90 a litre? And the answer is that their resources are limited, you know, the public anger is limited. The public can, the government's there all the time, the, the public can only afford to take a few days or a week or so off work. Uh, and they have to be really, really pushed to do that. And, um, and so the problem the government had, you know, and taking that as a specific example, was not that they, they weren't going to get to where they wanted to go, which was increasing fuel duty, you know, outrageously. It was that they pushed too far, too fast, and pushed people over the edge, and, and therefore they protested at a much lower level that, than was eventually achieved. The um, resistance at a higher level obviously comes because uh, of a more of a sort of an equilibrium pushback, not so much a, it's more of a chronic uh, pushback rather than the acute. The acute is where um, everyone uh, downs tools and goes on strike. And, um, and the chronic is where you've, you know, you really, people just can't afford fuel. <laughs> so they, they just stop buying it. And the mar so they've got the market forces uh, eventually determine the price. But anyway, the so the GDPA is um, you know had a had a tough time because the British Dental Association and the government have this relationship, this sort of tacit relationship whereby they um, don't push too hard against each other, um, which gives them both an easy ride. Um, and the two main losers in that are the are the profession. Um, on the BDA side and the uh, public from the Department of Health, you know, th these are the two groups that really should get a better deal, but don't because of this sort of cosy uh, relationship at the top. And um, it, it was inevitable that um, the, um, the GDP, they should try and exclude the GDPA from this. And there was, uh, up, up to I would say the sort of the 80s, there was a sort of, um, you know, there was a pluralism at the top of the Department of Health. There was this willingness to sort of take other points of view into account and to listen to everybody and take their points seriously and sort of try and argue with them on an intellectual basis and variously, uh, uh, you know, meet, meet with people on an equal basis. And, and then I, I'd say in the late 80s, early 90s, when the uh, GDPA was so effective in calling a national strike in response to the 1992 fee cut, the 7% fee cut, I think that the landscape completely changed. The, um, the thinking of the government and, and at the highest levels in the civil service after that point was to really try to exclude the, anyone who um, was, was in opposition. And that was because they couldn't win the intellectual argument, in my opinion. I think they really, um, you know, we straight away told them with, with all the new contracts, starting with the 1990-1992 contract, we told them what was wrong with it. We told them it would lead to less oral health, we told them it would lead to less dentistry, that, that it was inequitable, it was unfair, it would lead to a postcode lottery, etc. You could see all these things straight away. and. Um, and I don't, I don't know, you know, and they were like, oh, well, we don't think that's going to happen. And, but, but, you know, because they weren't dentists, because they weren't down in the high street, you know, they were they sort of, we could just, we knew how the guys and girls were going to react to this. And so we had a much better idea of how things were going to pan out in practice. And so, um, inevitably, <clears throat> things tended to go the way that we had predicted, but they were not at all interested in knowing in advance. They, as far as they were concerned, they had this, um, oh, oh, sorry, I've got a load of glass in the back. They had this sort of uh, model in their mind that they wanted to, to try, you know, they'd spend a lot of time and 
what they felt they invested a lot of neurons in this and they didn't want the last thing you want is people coming along and saying no you don't want to do it like that you know that's it's going to be a big disaster uh, so eventually uh, they sort of settled on this method of just excluding and they don't just exclude you from meetings I mean you you get um, it's pretty complete when the establishment decides that you're, you're anti-establishment then basically you don't exist you know you see you become a non-person you become a non-association so you don't get invited to a Department of Health events your your association is not listed under the list of dental associations on Department of Health websites um, you are you're invited to press briefings where they just recite news releases that they've media releases that they've already sent out um, and um, and yet yeah, you know the more favorable dental press are um, invited to private briefings in advance so that they can sort of come out with the news two or three weeks ahead of you I um, mean this was in the old days of print media um, nowadays of course you can I mean nowadays the, the old uh, the sort of the favored sources the print sources are the slowest uh, if you want to find out what's going on in um, dentistry you, you look at uh, uh, things like association emails or uh, our, a lot of our live tweeting from events you know so and it goes I mean it's I mean that's just the surface of it I mean it goes even deeper than that you know you're you're briefed against you're told you know you go along to a meeting and you you sort of you get quite chatty with someone who says yeah 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 and no, I'd be very interested in having a chat with you sort of give me a ring and then when you uh, give them a ring they you know all of a sudden no I'm sorry um, so and so is um, not can't talk to you and and you know it's because they've been got at you know someone said to them look you know these guys you, know, you don't want to be talking to them they're nothing but trouble they're, they are you know the word from the top is stay away from them and so um, so you get a lot of that and um, you know I went to the opening of uh, the Portsmouth Dental School I think it was and you know and everyone was there from the Department of Health and all the civil, civil servants and all the contractors and that in, been involved and Rosie Winston was the minister who was opening it up and everything and um, and she's like uh, she stared at me because uh, she'd never seen me before. She's everyone else there. She knew she didn't know who I was, so she stared at me a lot, wondering who I was. And um, and uh, you know, so I started off, and, and I said to you know, I said to someone, you know, this is this is a really impressive dental school. I said, how much did it cost? <laughs> and then they told me, and I'm like, oh really? <laughs> and then um, and then. Um, <clears throat> The word went round. Don't tell this guy anything. Don't tell this guy anything. So, so after that, I was just talking to people and just generally asking questions, which I suppose is, you know, I I'd been invited along as a journalist to cover the event and the cost and you know the number of students that it was likely to train as dentists and where they were going to come from. These were all perfectly valid questions, but all of a sudden everybody clammed up. And again, I knew it was because the word had gone around. You know, don't tell this guy anything. Don't tell him anything because knowledge is power and uh, they I think that you know you've got two completely different outlooks on it it's like <laughs> it's like supposing let's say off the top of my head supposing it cost 10 million this this thing there were there were two groups of people one who were like isn't this amazing this has cost 10 million pounds you know we've managed to get 10 million pounds off the taxpayer for this this is you know isn't this a fantastic public sector project what what a brilliant use of 10 million pounds <laughs> how and fancy turning 10 million pounds into this marvelous thing and yet and you've got a, a, a much much smaller group probably of one or two who's going around going oh my god 10 10 million pounds <laughs> 10 what I could have done with 10 million pounds give me 10 million pounds you know <laughs> give, give me 10 million pounds I could have doubled the number of dentists on the NHS in this country by making a few tweaks to the, the terms that do the GDS regs <laughs> not not built this massive great you know this massive great uh, you know steel and glass building uh, concrete building and with um, 
if I remember correctly, mannequins in it that were, you know, computer programmed to simulate heart attacks and need intravenous strips and stuff like that. Anyway, so so the GDPA, I mean, in, in latter days suffered, and it suffered because of uh, it was not ostracised, but in fact it was just isolated by the government, and it was downgraded from a representative association to basically just a, an association. A, a, a sort of an organisation that produced a dental magazine and it was afforded the courtesy of the dental press and not of, of a, a representative organisation. Not that it really stopped it functioning because, you know, I mean, there are no secrets in dentistry and then, you know, you can't hide anything and it's not like it's a fast-moving profession either, you know, any sort of, any sort of consultation on a new contract or any, any sort of... Um, change to the GDS terms and services uh, you had you had months to respond and there were no secrets the, you know it doesn't matter what it was that uh, was being proposed someone would ring us up and say oh have you heard that, you know, X Y and Z and we would say yeah as a matter of fact we have already we've heard that from someone else but thanks very much for telling us so so we had a massive great bunch of stringers and um, Anyway, so that was the GDPA. So what I'll do is I'll start, I'll carry on tomorrow and sort of uh, carry on with this, the story of the association and um, just like a potted history of the association, you know, and uh, where uh, you know, what happened to it, which will sort of lead you into uh, where we are now and, and where we're going to go. All right, I'm at work. Have a nice day. See you tomorrow. Bye.